Hi, my name is Brendan Smith. I'm the Arts and Humanities Coordinator for the City of Tacoma Park, and I want to welcome you to our latest online poetry reading. Uh, this is what America looks like. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, seven other poets whose work is featured in this new anthology, and we're going to have uh, the poetry editor from the book, Jonah Colson, serving as our MC. You can find more info about all of our uh, Tacoma Park Arts events if you go to tacomaparkmd.gov backslash arts. And uh, there you'll find a link to our YouTube channel, which includes a lot of different uh, performances, concerts, theater, more poetry readings. And you can also sign up for our weekly e newsletter. So hope you'll check that out. And you're welcome to use the chat function um, during the reading if you want to comment on a poem or a poet or just uh, share sort of any of your thoughts, you're, you're certainly welcome to do that. And then we will have a Q&A uh, at the end of the reading. So be thinking about maybe some questions you'll wanna ask. So uh, now I'm gonna hand things over to uh, Tacoma Park Poet Laureate Kathleen O'Toole for uh, her introduction as well. Thanks again for coming everyone. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to um, have you join us, those we can see and those we cannot see. Um, feel free to uh, say hi in the chat. I would like to just say how thrilled I am that this beautiful anthology is in all our hands and could be yours as well. I first met Jonah Colson when he read as a part of our Third Thursday series back in the day when we were still reading and sharing poetry in person at the community center. And so in, I guess, November of 2019, one of the last uh, robust readings before we all um, retreated into our little cloisters, Jonah came to read from his wonderful collection, Said Through Glass, and brought with him a gaggle of young uh, students from Montgomery County College from the ESL program who were there uh, just uh, listening to his every word. And it was delightful to have them as well. So I'm happy to be one of the poets that is included in this anthology. Um, and Jonah will introduce the anthology, introduce the wonderful poets that we have with us tonight. And I'll be reading last. So I will get to wrap it up uh, after hearing the rest of this wonderful collective. To you, Jonah, thanks for bringing this group to us. Thank you, Kathleen. It's a pleasure. Thank you to uh, Tacoma Park Art Center. Thank you to Brendan. Um, thank you to all the poets who are here this evening. It's such a wonderful group. I'm so happy to see everyone. You know, you work on an anthology and this started about over a year ago and you work on and you gather poems and, and uh, you hear all these wonderful, you know, hear and read all these wonderful poems. And, and since we haven't been able to get together, I, it's just so wonderful even just to see faces. So uh, many of you I know, some of you I don't. But either way, it's just been a pleasure reading your work and thank you for being with us um, here this evening. So again, my name is Jonah Colson and I'm the poetry editor of This Is What America Looks Like, available from your favorite uh, online retailer, though I believe it is available actually in stores like in po politics and prose and they're carrying some copies. So you can please grab it. There's wonderful poetry and fiction in here and lots of flash fiction, which is wonderful for someone who doesn't have a huge attention span like myself. Um, and I think that's one of the hallmarks of this as well. Um, Carolyn Bach, uh, you really curated some just wonderful flash fiction in this. And of course the poetry is, 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 is my favorite, but I'm a little biased there. So I just wanna briefly read from my introduction and then I'll introduce the first um, of our poets this evening. So the intention of this started before the pandemic, the intention of this anthology started before, um, you know, the current most, you know, uh, uh, um, palpable wave of, of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it was a response to the Women's March, right? Um, Kathleen, uh, Caroline Bach had you know, we, well, I was there as well. And the chant was, what does America looks like? And then, you know, the response chant was, this is what America looks like. And so our intention was really coming off of including a diverse and inclusive body of literature from our wonderful uh, DC, Maryland and Virginia 
area. And I think we've really, really succeeded very well and we're really proud of this. But the poems here specifically are intentional and focused and they engage with the current conversations about the pandemic, mass incarceration, police violence, racial profiling, educational systems, gender sexual expectations, and many, many more. Some of these poems respond more clearly to a lot of these issues and some are about belonging and some are about love and some are about loss, but they all really include our American experience and this powerhouse of a community that we have here um, in the DMV area. So once again, thank you to all for being here and for contributing such wonderful, wonderful poems. Really, really proud. So we're very proud of this book. The Washington Writers Publishing House is an independent uh, press that's been around for uh, over 45 years. It's all volunteer run. So our hearts were in this. So we hope that you really respond and uh, take a look at this book and uh, grab a copy because it's, it's definitely worth it. So let me introduce our first poet of this evening, which is Danuta Kos Kosiska. If I pronounce that correctly, Danuta, I apologize if I did not. But Danuta is the author of two collections, Face Half Illuminated from Apprentice House in 2015 and Oblige the Light from City Light in 2015. She is the winner of the fifth Clarinda Harris Poetry Prize. Danuta is a translator for four books by Lydia, Lydia Kosk. She is the poetry translations editor at Lock Raven Review. So welcome Danuta. Thank you so much for being here. I'm mute. <laughs> Good evening to all of you, friends old and new. Thanks for organizing this event, uh, Brandon and um, Jonna, and for um, including me in this particular reading. Uh, congratulations to Caroline and Jonna because this book is really, really well made. And yes, it shows that your hearts were in it. I answered the call for submissions for several reasons. And um, first of them is that I like the title. I really do. And um, because I'm interested in diversity and I promote it. I arrived in America in 1980 from behind the Iron Curtain from a communist country. Um, I came as a biochemist on a two year postdoctoral fellowship from Muscular Dystrophy Association. And I was amazed and astounded at the diversity of people I met here and the different cultures. So we all bring something to share, to weave together. And that's what America is to me, a first generation American and an accidental immigrant. Uh, so let's keep it that way. As the poetry translation editor at La Craven Review since 2011, I made it my mission to promote diversity and inclusiveness. I featured over 100 poets writing in 20 languages and their translators who bring these works to the English speaking um, readers. And um, a lot of, I mean, it's, they are from all over the world, but many of them are from, from this region. And actually this is another reason why I was interested to be included in the anthology because it's the region that I find very diverse and very interesting. So Brendan suggested we share some background about our poems in the one in the anthology. It refers to the common ground on the hill, which is an annual multicultural event, which I attended in the 90s, and it is still going on. Started with musicians from all over America and then the world, and then other arts. I participated in poetry classes, and also I learned to make prints from carvings in linoleum blocks. This was totally new to me, and that's what you get when you get with diverse people. And um, the class was taught by Sean Lockhart, and later she made the unique <laughs> cover for my 
book of uh, poems from the trip I to, uh, took to um, Mexico. So I asked her, this book is titled On the Verge of Light and Shadow, and this is the ser Feathered Serpent. And I'm talking about it because in the poem I'll be reading, there appears a feathered serpent. And then I also talk about this class I took. Okay. On common ground in Westminster, Maryland. The first hour is green grass and red brick buildings. The shade evaporates. Then the bagpipe and Indian flute pull apart the sticky air and burst in the force of July fireworks. On the second day, we begin to carve. The gouge uncovers softness in linoleum blocks, like plowing a furrow in the ground wherein seeds are sown. The harvested grain turns into oblong loaves rising under linen cloth. Whiffs of fresh baked bread, a genie released from the battle of time, take us to other continents. For five days, we weave the words, tie and untie roots, streams, rocks, the feathered serpent and Celtic knots. When the last evening arrives, on the stage, we sing our multi-voiced poem. Then, then I want to read two short poems, and they both happen in, in, in uh, Maryland. <laughs> so that's why I chose them. That's one of the reasons. But they also explain how, like the first one will tell, tell you how, how come I stayed in this country. I didn't come here to stay. So. Um, it's Sunday like no other, and that Sunday was December 13, 1981, when we learned about martial law in Poland. And there are two people in the poem. My Polish scientist friend going back to Poland after two years at the University of Maryland, and our American friend taking him to the airport. Sunday like no other, Baltimore, 1981. Third floor, left, first door. He opens, smiling white. She is early. Suitcases line the wall. He hasn't heard. He doesn't know. She steps over the threshold. You can't go home. This morning, the general in his dark shades declared martial law. His green eyes, his impeccable manners from old Europe. But Sarah, you will take me to the airport, right? Her car radio repeats the world news. Martial law in Poland. No travel allowed. Phones disconnected. Tanks in the streets. Solidarność band, curfew at 20.00. At the airport, he presents his return ticket to Warsaw. His will be the last flight. Don't go into the darkness, she repeats in her head. The call for boarding, his green eyes. Head high, he walks toward the exit. Her arm lifts and waves. The door shuts. And the last uh, poem was inspired by a copy of uh, Mark Chagall's painting I saw in the um, doctor's waiting room. So you spent hours and it's good to, to have something to look at. And the poem starts with the typical Chagall's elements, okay? And then it moves to where we live, a house in the suburbs. Mm, my son, then almost a teenager, appears in this poem. Now a historian, he lives with his family in Canada. 
And yes, you guessed it. The borders are closed. We can't see, visit him. We can't see my mom in Poland. But uh, I, I believe that my son is listening from Montreal. This is to my brave, awesome son. And to all of you listening, health and happiness. Painting in a gray world waiting room. A village, houses upside down, a green cow, pink air, onion dam church, a synagogue, a groom, a bride, a long white dress. They float, they dance. A fiddler, a blue goat playing a violin. In the village where I live, houses are shades of beige. Beige brown deer devour colors. No couples dance above the steepled church. In the sky, sometimes a heron flies, mostly hawks and planes. A groom and his bride at a crab feast wear blue jeans. A goat and a cow graze behind the picket fence when I drive to school with my son. The cello is still bigger than he. Tonight, I watch my son's eyes smile, embracing his cello. He floats, bouquets, back concerto. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danuta. Those were absolutely lovely. And your reading was so lovely. And I have to say, um, I am a Maryland boy. I am from Westminster, Maryland. Ah. Um, and uh, the one that's included in this book on common ground in Westminster, Maryland was, uh, it was just wonderful to see Westminster, Maryland in a poem. And so it, that meant a lot to me. So thank you so much. Totally beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Let's keep going. And then we're going to come back for a question and answer at the end. So if you have any questions, again, please feel free to place them in the chat. Um, we're a few of us going to be uh, perusing and collecting uh, questions from the chat if you would like to ask after all of our poets have read. <clears throat> so our next poet this evening is Fran Abrams. So Fran Abrams, um, Rockville, Maryland, began writing poetry in 2017, very recently. Several of her poems have been published online and in print. She read as a jury poet at Houston Poetry Fest in October of 2019, and as a featured reader at Diverse Gaithersburg Poetry Reading Series from Gaithersburg, Maryland in December of 2019. And feel free to visit her more at franabramspoetry.com. And I know there's also a lot of her own, um, she's an artist. It was a sculpture, you do sculpture and sort of, uh, well, anyways, wonderful. Check her, check her out. If you don't know Fran Abrams, please do. Uh, so welcome, Fran. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonah. I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm so honored to be included in this collection. Um, I'm going to read, the first poem I'm going to read is the one that is in the collection. And sadly, it is still relevant today as it was when I wrote it. <clears throat> the circus is here. Why would anyone go to the circus anymore? We know wild animals are not happy to be tamed. Performers could be killed. And wait, someone shot Cecil the lion in the wild. A Cirque du Soleil aerialist fell to his death on a stage in Florida. Why pay the price of admission to a circus? If you want to see wild animals bleed, Watch the adventures of the Uber Ridge. If you want to see people die, watch the news. The next poem I'm going to read is about what happened on January 6th, 2021. It's included in a collection called It Can't Happen Here by Moonstone Press. It's called 
the heart of power. I presume that white men in positions of power deep in their hearts were afraid that black protesters in the summer of 2020 were determined to loot and burn DC. So afraid they lined the steps of the Capitol with law enforcement officers in riot gear, met peaceful marchers with tear gas and helicopters. I surmise that white men in positions of power were convinced that white supremacists had no desire to destroy property, no intent to challenge democracy. So convinced, they lined the front of the Capitol with flimsy barricades easily tossed aside, met men and women set on insurrection with no plan to deter them. No matter how long we search for reasons for events on January 6th, 2021, we will not find answers until we look deep in our hearts. The next poem is based on a recent article in the Washington Post about the increase in post office shipments of cremated remains. It's called, What Remains? Human remains, says the bright orange label, procured by funeral home directors at post office to ship cremated grandfather to granddaughter, remains of brother to surviving sister. In pandemic times, the living cannot travel to the dead. The dead, ashes sealed in plastic bags, packed in boxes, travel in post office, trucks to find family. Postal service rules require a signature upon receipt. This box may not be placed on front stoop or next to garage door. A live person must receive it. Humans remain to grieve. My next poem was written for all of us who have wanted to travel this past year, but did not. It's called, This Poem Takes You to the Ocean. This is a poem that smells like the ocean. Take a deep breath and welcome salty air. Bring along your imagination and you may be able to smell French fries for sale on the boardwalk. This is a poem that sounds like the ocean. Listen and you will hear waves meeting sand over and over, the rippling shushes as water runs back into the sea. And perhaps you can hear the cries of a seagull overhead, watching for a forgotten French fry to add to its meal. This is a poem that tastes like the ocean. No, not the taste of swallowing salt water when you did not mean to do that. This poem tastes of air heavy with humidity of beach sand that gets in your mouth, no matter how careful you are, of sunscreen when you kiss your little one moments after smearing her with lotion. This is a poem that takes you to the ocean, even on days when there is no sunshine and the ocean is miles away. Go to the ocean, find peace, or at least treat yourself to saltwater taffy. This is another poem about a poem and it will end my portion of the program this evening. I'd like to end on a sweet note. This poem is called, Tastes Like Chocolate. I have always wanted to write a poem that tastes like chocolate. Feel the words melt on your tongue. Savor the sweet sensation in your taste buds. Enjoy each delectable word. I have always wanted a recipe that puts my poem in the same class as the world's best brownie. Smooth texture in your mouth, releasing chocolate flavor, words to make you swoon. If I knew the ingredients for a poem that tastes like chocolate, I would offer my poem to those who insist, I've never really understood poetry 
and push bombs away. With a palm that tastes like chocolate, I might tempt more people to enjoy a morsel of insight, a reminder of sweetness, a few words of comfort. Thank you. And thank you for being here tonight to support poetry. Thank you so much, Fran. They were so wonderful. I, um, the, the sensual ones, uh, the, your response to the five senses and your response and the images are totally great. I, you know, you started writing poetry in 2017. Really? Uh, okay. So <laughs> also I would point out those of you who have bought the book or are going to buy the book that the po the sequence of uh, writers is Z to A, right? So that was agreed upon kind of early on. And when I realized when we all discovered that Fran's poem was the last work in the anthology. I was so delighted because I think it's the most appropriate way from all of these works to end the anthology here with her poem, The Circus is Here. And I think it's a wonderfully, it's a controlled, beautiful poem. And um, hopefully we come back in q and I, I have a few questions for you, Fran, but thank you so much. Thank you, Jonah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. So next is Kadani, Kadani Normal, Normil. Am I saying that correctly, Kadani? Yes, sir. Thank you. Born in New Jersey and reared in Port-au-Prince, works as a senior sales manager with Jacobs Engineering Group, where he's had the opportunity to work in the Middle East for several years. He now lives in Aldi, Virginia with his wife and two children. And may I add that he is a graduate from the MFA program at American University. So. Welcome, Kadani. So happy you're here with us this evening. Thanks, Jonah. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, it's it's interesting because I, I haven't uh, even attempted to publish something in years, right? <laughs> Not since, you know, immediately after the, the MFA program. So it, it was quite uh, an honor and uh, an ex uh, unexpected honor to, to get to get included. Um, so thank you so much for, for the opportunity to, to do that and, and to read today. Um, uh, I guess as a general background um, for myself and, and these poems, uh, I am the son of uh, immigrants from Haiti. My parents came here in the 70s, um, had me here, but I was actually raised in, in Haiti. Uh, my father took me back when I was just three months old. So I grew up you know, in Haiti, you know, culturally, uh, uh, as far as worldview, it's my, 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 my background is very Haitian. Um, and then I moved here um, permanently to start going to school when I was 12. So I've been living here longer than I lived in Haiti. Um, but I still um, consider myself you know, very much an immigrant and, or the son of, of immigrants. And that, that definitely informs uh, my poetry and, and the way I, I see the world. Um, I'm going to just read a few poems uh, today, obviously the, the one in the, in the anthology. Uh, this is, uh, what can I say, this is a poem about uh, pain, uh, it's a poem about love, it's a poem about redemption, um, and a conversation between two people um, that is ongoing. You had asked when I drifted so far away, you had asked why I didn't turn towards you. I've been searching for that boy, once so firmly tethered, the boy who faced you in the dark that night and whispered you his life story, kissed you softly over and over and over until you opened for him. The boy who tore out his beating, beaten, damaged heart and handed it to you, dripping of blood and sadness the boy who wrote odes to your thighs and poured libations to the curves of your perfect breasts. The teary eye boy with the aura of sadness that you plucked from the sinking quicksand of his life. I called you Redeemer. I called you Savior. Tonight, I will meet you in the dark again. I will talk to you instead of a God that never speaks to me. I will swear to never revisit what was done in pain, never reread what was scribbled through tears, 
never rehear what was uttered through gritted teeth. Um, in the spirit of my background as an immigrant, uh, I wanted to read an older poem that uh, touches on immigration and the disenchantment a lot of immigrants, um, especially immigrants from third world countries feel when, when, they, when they arrive to this country and the, the disparity or the, the, the disconnect between what they had in their heads and what is real once they settle here. This is called Exodus in Fog. Over bright moon splits back faces in two, zigzag fragments of black and white, superimposed against sea blown shadow trees, swaying the right way behind us. It is past midnight and we approach without words, and from the mist of an overhanging cliff, some nighttime creature calls out to me. We're too neighbor to voyage emoji, but this boat has plans. And here I am again, engulfed in the raw fragrance of the sea, my nappy hair glittering, a wild prism caked with sea salt, while I probe a vacated crab shell with my big toe. And here I am again, wondering how far we would get before the sea came crashing, the accidental push and shove, the inadvertent trip and fall overboard into wide open shark bow or eaten whole with clothes and all. And what is this blinding light? And what is this faring tongue? And who are these men with guns? And where are the streets of gold? And where are the open arms? And what is this Guantanamera, this Guantanamo? But once again, here I am again, longing for the noontime shade of an arching mango tree longing for the muggy serenity of my Aitsi Shevi. Uh, this next poem is about, at least for me, uh, feeling muted in a lot of ways, having lived here for so long. Um, my experience has been interesting in working in the corporate world and sometimes feeling you know, isolated. And this, this tries to give voice to that. This is also an older poem and it you know, still rings true in a lot of ways. This is called Unsaid. Unsaid. Let my tongue be knotted in knowing. Let me stutter in the attempt to reach beyond the gate and snatch you by your neck and squeeze. Push me this way and that way, still nothing falls from my mouth. Silence is comfort, companion. I will not speak. I'd rather stitch my lips with threads of inverse loyalty to seal the pulsing truth. I saw you dancing under golden shadows, shuffling in that muted trance, while the overripe fruit dangles before you, stretching towards earth. The eaching teaches change, yet change brings danger, like the catastrophe that bobs and weaves behind my eyelids to conceal its Medusa head that speaks for the dead. I will not speak. Words can be poison, spilled in a stream for birds to sip on as they die, with high yellow beaks poised, pointed at the guilty. I never knew that words could glow in the dark, but this slant tongue is a beaming neon sutra that rotates in odd repetitions under the muffled tones of dark rivers, pressed down in your torture chambers, repressed emotions digress with time, but time is on my side and God is on my side and sideways glances cut me down. Can you hear the octave thundering on the eighth line? Eight by eight, seven by seven, and I'm still reaching, reaching. But I hear no words, and I'm not speaking, not ascending. There is no light. There are no seraphs hailing, laudamuste, glorificamuste. And I was taught to sing, vocame cum benedictis, but no words, damn it. Damn me for not speaking. And no one is calling for me among the blessed, the weak of heart.
and um, I'll read uh, one more poem. Um, this is called When Rain Falls, and it captures a very uh, poignant experience in my childhood living in two different worlds. You know. um, for example, when I go home, I don't speak English. I speak Creole and sometimes French with my family. Um, and then when I leave home, I'm speaking only English. So I've kind of lived in different worlds and this is a very unique experience from one of these worlds. When rain falls. One, we laughed and swayed, sitting on the edge of jagged walls the day's end slanting elegantly down the soft angles of our faces. Girls with candied voices giggle and parade, hooked on the frenzied tip of our boyhood musk. We unclothe them with x-ray eyes. Two, rain cuts down hard and sideways from a sky that constantly promises rainbows, reaching from balding mountaintops to the trash adorned gutters of Cite Soleil. We run into midday shower, wearing ragged shorts and dingy underwear, our hands cupped, heads cocked back to drink the sky. Three, we wash each other and the sun still shining through this land of rain, paradoxes and wolves with wings. Our clothes have become hydraulic dripping off our small bodies at the lazy pace of wax, slow riding the side of a black candle to come to rest as small angels frozen in prayer. That's it. Thank you so much, Jonah. Wow, Kadani. I think you said it at the very beginning that maybe you haven't done this for a while or you haven't um, read for a while, but I think I speak for all of us when I say that we need your work. And Thank you. Hear more of it. Um, I'll please, try. <laughs> please, for all of us. Um, you know, make me, the, the poems included here, you know, you've, you've written a love poem here, you know, that's in the book. And then, but your others speak so much to the perspectives and, um, you know, this larger sort of narrative that I hope that we get to talk about a little bit in our um, Q&A after. So thank you, Kadani. So lovely. Welcome. To you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next up this evening is Jessica, Jessica Garrett, who may I just say I first met, I took a class at the Writer's Center years ago and we wrote about, um, well, we wrote lots of poems. I don't know if it was a week or was like spaced out within like a few weeks. I think every single poem because of Jessica really, every single poem I wrote for that somehow was just wonderful because of her technique and her ability. Jessica is a wonderful poet. Uh, originally from Sykesville, Maryland, her book Fire Pond won the Aga Shahid Ali Prize for Poetry and was published by the University of Utah Press. If you don't have Fire Pond, please consider taking a look at it. She lives in University Park, Maryland with her husband and daughter and is pursuing a second career as a clinical psychologist. So thank you, Jessica, for being here. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Jonah. I gather you're a wonderful teacher yourself these days. <laughs> and he was a wonderful student for sure, one of my favorites. So um, it's really great to be here. And I really appreciate um, being included in the anthology. It's also been a while since I've done a reading. Um, and I think this might be my first Zoom reading actually. Um, and so, feels a little funny, but also nice um, and nice to be reading with all the, the poets um, that are gathered tonight. So um, I'm going to read just two poems. And um, the first one is the one from the, in the anthology. And they're both kind of local, local poems. I think of them as local poems now. Um, the one from the anthology is actually kind of an older poem for me. And um, set in DC from when I lived in DC. I lived around the H Street Northeast, um, in the H Street Northeast neighborhood. And um, this poem is uh, about trying to get back to writing after having not written for a little while. 
and um, I, I go to the Library of Congress main reading room in the poem. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's a very, um, I, I don't think I went back. I only went that one time, but it's a very grand place. Um, called back. How strange to have done it, to have walked over a mile from my newly rented room in a three-story house in the middle of January, midweek, mid-afternoon, toward the Capitol Dome, rising larger and larger over Maryland Avenue, on past the Supreme Court, where a man on the sidewalk said to a camera crew, what do we want? Dialogue between religions. And around the corner to the Library of Congress, where I passed between security sensors, took an elevator ride to the cloakroom, left some belongings, brought others, my laptop, a few books, my notebook, you, and one pen, this, into the grand main reading room with its lofty arches, firm columns, gold dome, where I set my freedom app for 100 minutes of no internet. And here I sit beneath the statues of honored men, art, science, letters, riskily towing the overlook, the balustrade, weathering bronzely, the small sounds from below that dilate, time-like, and turn soft-edged with echo that laps and overlaps, surrounds equally like a milky haze, the three separate orbits of desks where scholars bow their heads and where I too have a spot, a temporary fixed address, 344, the gold plate reads, as if just for today, I'm indexed or cataloged or charted at these coordinates I've settled on by a process braided with purpose and chance in order to write a poem. Isn't that funny? A poem, that's what I came to this clearing to find. But wait, cries a voice pinned under my heavy winter mind, a daily minded mind. What in the world is a poem? The air around 344 ignites. I don't know, I don't know, my whole self sings, giddy and Junish, looking around and through the signaled quiet. My whole self, blank but risen to eye level lookout, called more fully back to what? Yes, exactly, after so much time away. Uh, the second poem is called C Sharp. And this is a more recent poem set in Maryland where I live now. I live in University Park um, by the University of Maryland. And uh, for those who live in this area, I don't know how many of you do, but um, Tacoma Park is not too far. Uh, Lake, Ar Lake Artemisia appears in the poem. Um, and uh, I mentioned Alice in the poem, that's my daughter who is um, just almost five. And it starts with a thought I had right before waking up. Um, and it felt like maybe it ha had a little bit of wisdom in it and I sort of tried to carry it into the day with me. Um, so it's another poem about kind of like called back about sort of a hard to describe feeling or a um, something sort of unnameable feeling. C sharp. It arrived on the slippery bridge from sleeping to waking. The thought that if I could just make one clear note each morning, one clear C sharp, how specific, then loop back to it all day like crochet. If I could live it, let things gather to it like a spindle, then my mind's noisy thicket might clear, the flat disorder concentrate. Things might rhyme again. I tried it out, a few hums, sheepish, uncertain, sitting in our living room. And then I was giddily surprised. The, a freight train's horn joined me almost right away, our sounds pairing easily 
as though old friends from a forgotten plane now briefly tuned back into. Later, I tried again, Lake Artemisia, looking up from my book, orange light sloshing over treetops past the water, repeating in water, repeating now too in my hum. I kept doing it very low, and it was good company to the metro train squealing by, the jogger's rhythmic footfall. It threaded a child's rangy wail. It matched the flickering V way up against the blue, blinking wings in the lowering light, bringing Alice to mind in star pose last night, eyes fluttering quick, her sense of how to twinkle. C sharp, again, again, would any tone have given the same? Two geese lowering toward their kin on the lake, one clear honk returned, water, sky, water, sky, echoing back and forth till the long shh of landing, the wake of V's trailing, a flurry of happy honking, C sharp, the world gathered in rhythm and play. I felt softened and also sharpened, though now I can feel my shadow mind trying not to trust it, to reinvite scarcity. Shh, land here. Um, thank you. Jessica, I love those. Thank you so much. And may I just say that Alice is one of my favorite names in the entire world. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's totally great. So thank you so much. I love the landscapes. Um, that inspiration. And when I remember when I first read your poem, I'm going through all the submissions that we had and your description, I just felt like I was there with you, you know, going to the Library of Congress. And it's just really wonderful, precise description. That also, it also opens up to, uh, you know, something that's so individual, but opens up to something that's collective. So thank you for your work. So beautiful. Thank you. Next up this evening, is Nubia Kai, which I'm so excited to um, meet her for the first time here. Nubia Kai is a poet, playwright, and novelist who has been published in numerous anthologies and literary journals. Many, I can imagine. She is a Larry Neal Writers' Competition winner and a recipient of two National Endowment for the Arts Awards and six DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Awards for Poetry. So welcome, Nubia. Wonderful to have you here this evening. Can you unmute yourself, Nubia? Okay, how's that? You're perfect, got it. Okay. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank the editors, uh, Jonah and Caroline, for uh, you know, uh, choosing my poem for this wonderful anthology, just wonderful work that you've done, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Uh, the poem I would like to read is the poem from the collection, but as you may remember, the poem is much longer, and you say, well, look, it's too long for the anthology, but can we use the first part? And it's like, okay, you can use the first part, but actually, um, you know, I, I think I like it better with all three parts. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the entire poem, um, the all three parts of the poem. And the poem was inspired by uh, a trip I had taken to Cuba. I hadn't been in Cuba in 24 years. I went in 2017 and I was so impressed with the, the people and the, the progress of the, of the revolution that I became active in doing uh, Cuban solidarity work. And so the same year I went to New York to the hearing on ending the resolution uh, uh, to end the embargo against Cuba. This, this embargo had been going on almost 60 years now. And this was the 26th year of the hearing before the United Nations in which all of the countries, except for the United States and Israel, said that the, the, the blockade, the embargo was inhumane, and it should end. But anyway, what I'm writing about is the impression that I got after hearing at the time, Nikki Haley 
was the UN ambassador. And her attitude about the, the, all the things that were being said, and then the, the resolution finally. So it's in three parts, starting with the debate, the opposition, and the, um, the resolution, the vote. Okay, so it's called A72 slash 1.2 resolution. The necessity of ending the economic, commercial, and financial embargo imposed by the United States of America against Cuba. The debate. The arms of the octopus are angry. Green with envy and hate that his colored baby doll ran away from home and built a house of her own on the Bimini streams of the Caribbean of gold rock and pearls winding a footpath to a temple of tenacity, the one we found at the doorsteps of this concretized dream. It was right under our eyelids. It was right under our shoeless, callous feet, feeling the riches of the earth. It was right under our nose, smelling the mariposa and hibiscus. We reached out our hands, took the scent, and soil and vision, fashioned it the way God fashioned Adam into the woman and men we wanted to be. We did this as the world watched in trance at the unfolding miracle of orchids replenishing the mangrove swamps, breaking the hurricanes back with the sickle and hoe singing in unison and planting fruits so sweet we share with the toilers the, with joy. See the butterfly jasmines, they toss on our shores in gratitude, like petals adorning, adorning the nuptial bed of nations. See the bee hummingbird, the smallest bird, the smallest frog, the smallest moth be giants today in word and deed curling the hurricane arms of the octopus around this mendacious throat. Cuba si la que no, it has already happened. Two, U.S. position opposition. What trouble is viewing in the slave quarters? The darkies are restless tonight. The darkies are always restless, even though we gave them the conga drum and the clavicles to calm their nerves and that nasty Roomba dance to shake off the oversex sizzle of their sweat. This is the 26th time they have brought us before this colony of nations to hear the other darky people whine with them about our sanctions, sanctioned by God himself against the enemies of capital. Capital is God. Gold, silver, sugar, cotton, tobacco, the same things they say are detestable as what they desire. Let them rot in their compost like the garbage they are, and they will rot in the fertilizing dung of disaster before we lift them out of the muck they have created for themselves. Frankly, these darky shows laced in political rhetoric are quite boring and predictable. Man tan Moreland shuffling and stuttering in Spanish, Mandarin and Bantu, only now bungee jumping across continents, wild eyed and pissing on himself, afraid to fly, afraid to swim. I want no more of this court face nonsense. Bleeding hearts pouncing like rabbits from a magician's hat. Sambo and Buckwheat playing tag behind the barn. Swami, how I love you, how I love you in your bandana head servitude, cutting the sugar cane, fanning flies from my mid julep lips. How I love your mesmerizing voice when it's sung of my glory with the whip on your back. <laughs> yes. I am intoxicated with the conqueror's lust for power. I do because I can. And what can you, Zip Coon, Jim Dandy, Con Man do to teach your way out of this entrapment of trade secrets? How do you, Master Juba, tap dance to the stars with your shoes tied together? Better go with P.T. Barnum, 
where the freaks are fun. But for me, you know, I don't want to see George Washington's 137-year-old nanny or Mammy's colossal breast sucked by puppy dogs, ain't your Mammy on the pancake box lookalike contest, or those high kick cars lined mulatto bitches trying to pass for pretty. Oh, these coon shows should be banned. Because all, all Jim Crow needs today is a hip replacement. If he's smart enough to pull his broken hip up by his bootstraps and buy him some medical insurance. If he can't, shame on him. Shouldn't have been born dumb. Three, the vote. 191 for the resolution, two against. No surprise, with the new Nazi takeover of the United States government, manifest destiny back on the menu of greedy octopuses, or that the survivors of Nazism would become shadow Nazis themselves, building walls, arsenals, nuclear military empires, playing fiddlesticks with people's lives because they can, because the chessboard was reversed, because the Southern projection of Morris maps was flipped on his head and deflated because they stole all the books and forgot they were stolen. They see from the cracks of their butts as they sit atop the world alone, wishing they had a friend, wishing it was not so dark in this world of darkies, wishing they were loved rather than feared that the Machiavellian pact with the devil would expire before dawn and love petals could be tossed on the shores of their America. Like Cuba, see, see, we see, we hear the Agwe rhythms of your soul strings in the unrelenting forests of gorillas whose ghosts touch their faces to the ground in a Santeria dance of redemption. In the song that never stops weaving its winds through the royal palms, shielding the true royalty of the workers each one a queen and king of the land, the guanguango seduction of sea and sky, the plain space of a political battle they could not win, condemned 191 times before the international firing squad of words, America, America, you are already dead. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> Thank you so much, Nubia. I had Thank forgotten you. I had forgotten the parts of that poem. I remember when I first read it for um for the anthology and all these poems, but I remember this poem moved me to look this up. I think it was a part of my history that I was unfamiliar with. And I wanted to, you know, this poem calls to action. And thank you so much for it and for your voice. Um, Thank you. It also speaks the relationship with other countries that we've had in some of the other poems. Um, Poland and then uh, with Kadani with um, Haiti. And so it just is a wonderfully, um, the images and the power in that poem. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next poet is Christopher Goodrich. Thank you. Christopher is a resident of Montgomery County, Maryland, and he's published three books of poetry. By Reaching, Nevertheless, Hello, <laughs> that's a fun title, and No Texting at the Dinner Table. He is the recipient of an Emerging Writers Fellowship from the Writers Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and two Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Prizes. So thank you. Welcome, Christopher. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody. So good to see you. So good to be among you. You're all leading such wonderful and important lives. Hopefully some of that can rub off on me. So I'm going to read uh, two poems tonight. The first is from the anthology, this wonderful anthology. And these are two, these are two new poems and these are two uh, quarantine poems. And, um, and they may be two coronavirus poems. So uh, the first 
recounts that um, that feeling of, of wanting to speak to somebody, wanting to um, be in somebody's presence, um, but being unable to. It's called All My Friends Are Dying Without Me Knowing It. Because I moved away from New York and had children and married, but not in that order. Because I stopped writing and met new people and didn't call, figured I'd do it next week. And then next week came, but a week had already passed and that felt awkward. So it turned into two weeks and the dog grew old. So old, in fact, we bought a guinea pig and I kept seeding the lawn and work made me sad and bitter. And my kids grew up little by big and I discovered Annapolis and listened to more and more Paul Simon and gave Philadelphia a chance. The internet played a role because out of boredom on some shelter in place Friday, I remembered my past and who you were in it. I searched for your name, but I was months and months too late, a whole season. And it happened at that same moment, my bedroom walls needed painting. So I tried my best to paint them because I didn't know how else to feel this feeling without simultaneously fixing something. Because I haven't taken myself seriously or your time seriously, because I have lived as if you were still possible without the possibility of your leaving me here without you. And I'll read one more poem, uh, a, a new poem about uh, a certain return and it's called Someday We Will All Go Back to Work, written uh, January, 2021. When we walk, we can't walk close enough. When we dress, it's a leap from night sweats to day sweats, a commute that brings us down the steps and up again. But soon, we will all gather around Janet's desk, sing her happy birthday in one part melody. You know Daryl will belt the bridge in his signature falsetto while Peter dishes out the paper plates. We will feed each other once again from the veggie tray, Angelo's crock pot full of sloppy joe. We will stay until the conversation stutters and one of us will slow roll into, well, I should probably dot, dot, dot. And we will, like we used to, return to our offices, stippled with post-its and central office memoranda to answer yesterday's emails, undercover laugh at Jim's jokes, apologize for not getting back sooner. We will find ourselves reaching out to Lisa, asking when the meeting starts, when the meeting ends. And like we used to, wish Donovan a good evening on the way to our annual review. Katina will motion to please close the door behind us. And just like that, we will. Won't it be delicious? All that chocolate frosting, Janet's favorite all those neon fluorescents overhead, all those people keeping us from our work, a leftover piece waiting for us in a department fridge. Tomorrow, if we come in early enough, we'll have a real shot at it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You're, uh, I remember when I first read your poem, I laughed out loud and then I felt bad for laughing, you know, because you have this sort of this wryness here that, you know, you comment on, on, you know, these every day and I love how you include, you know, sort of these names in the poems and then you feel, you know, like the, the, the reality, the image and the reality, it's just a wonderful gift that you have. So thank you for those, totally great. Um, and I think when we all go, if, if 
some of us work in businesses. I think that uh, in some ways we're hoping for those things to happen in the office space, but then I, maybe some of us really enjoy uh, being here at home. I'm not sure. It'd be interesting uh, to get back, right? So thank you. Our last um, poet this evening is the Poet Laureate of Tacoma Park, Maryland, Kathleen O'Toole. So she's the current Poet Laureate of Tacoma Park, Maryland, and has combined an active public life as a community organizer and trainer with writing and teaching. Her fifth and most recent collection of poetry this far was relieved by Paraclip Press in 2019. So thank you, Kathleen, for being here and for being Poet Laureate. Thank you, Jonah. And thanks to all the other um, poets who have joined us. I'm so honored to be with you this evening, such an array of voices and life experiences and musics. I have particularly enjoyed shutting off my camera and just listening to the music once or twice. So thank you for being with us and sharing your talent with our audience. Um, I'm only gonna read two poems because I'd like to give our audience a chance to uh, ask some questions and for us to talk. Um, the poem that is in the anthology bears a little bit of explanation. Um, Jonah mentioned that I have been a community organizer, um, a good four decades of community organizing work, a decade of which was in Baltimore. And I found myself in the wrenching um, position of being with my husband on a business and uh, exploratory trip in Istanbul, Turkey, and watching the uprising in Baltimore on CNN. I had worked in that city for many years and I knew those very streets with some intimacy. And so um, the thought that this is what America looks like to the world, the bias of what was being portrayed and the stories that were not being told in that presentation um, led me to write this poem. Um, it became a ghazal or hazal, I've heard it pronounced, um, a Persian poetry form. I was inspired to try it by being in that part of the world. Um, and also because of the obsessive rhyme repetition that's in it to contain my emotions. Fractured hazal for Baltimore. From a great distance, I grieve my city in flames, angry crowds like an oil spill igniting, pity and blame surge as the CNN clips reprise a burning, turning police car. Predictable reactions, the camera's capacity to shame. Also, nuance is lost, other narratives buried in this new crucible intensities the game. Before, civil rights pastors, union stewards, and housewives fought to reclaim these blocks, their city of no fame. Now, with riot the lead, Freddie Gray's shadow grows, glows to an icon's intensity, immensity. His name chanted and wailed. I echo the lament as new voices demand a stake to move beyond the gritty freeze frame. And the second poem I'll read is from my latest book this far that Jonah mentioned, <clears throat> and also um, relates to uh, the kinds of stories that I encountered in uh, community organizing. In this case, I was working in Northern Virginia with an organization called Voice. And uh, we took on at the time, maybe 2009, um, the backlog in people who were legally within our broken immigration system and could not get from their legal um, status to green card to citizenship and were really stuck in this machine. And in that part of Virginia at that time, a lot of them were our Muslim brothers and sisters. And so this poem, um, which I wrote after hearing the stories of many of the members of a certain mosque in Northern Virginia about just where they were stuck um, reflects, I've changed the names, but reflects the story of one of those families. And it was first published in Split This Rock 
on their website. Halim waiting. He arrived first as a student of geology in the bicentennial year. He witnessed the fireworks, read the declaration and believed it. One by one, he brought his family, Fahima, Anas, Nasser. Today, they are all citizens. He alone waits. He built houses, a business, this dream. 18 years of waiting to savor the meat he first smelled roasting on Manhattan streets. His father's home in Baghdad is in ruins. The cousins in Najaf are dead, conscripted. His youngest son has brought the daughter of a family friend to Virginia to marry. Even she will be a citizen before him. Each time he travels home, one more letter in his file for helping the war effort. Still, at each airport, the pat downs, pull asides, manhandling, the eyes. At the immigration office, they say, one more name check, one more set of fingerprints. His wife says, now they will not give this. They need to keep him on the leash. Thank you very much. And back to you, Jonah, to open us up for some questions. Yes, thank you, Kathleen. Totally beautiful. I love, of course, I love both of those poems. And your last poem, uh, well, both poems, the last poems also made me think of some of some um, of the different separate narrative threads that we've heard specifically this evening. And I've been monitoring the chat, um, trying to take a look at some of the chat. And maybe if I may, I would just like to open up some questions for all of our poets. Maybe we can hopefully hear from each of you. I know we have about a little over 15 minutes um, before we're gonna get kicked out of here. But I wanna hear from each of you a lot of tonight, and I didn't necessarily plan this. I knew the poems that were, of course, were in the book that you were going to read, but your others also came into this narrative of landscapes, of immigration, of different perspective, also of language and appro approaching culture from a different perspective um, and from a different language perspective. But maybe I could just focus on a more generalized question. Maybe in considering immigration or in considering your perspective on where we are, right? I mean, I've my family has been here for a few generations, so I'm not a recent um, immigrant. I grew up learning, you know, my native language is English, um, but coming from it from a different perspective, and just this impulse is, you know, this is what America looks like. What are the ways in which you feel that the poems that you read this evening, and maybe specifically the poem that's included in the anthology? How do you feel that relates to the narrative of what America is now? Maybe you could just comment a little bit on how you feel that that poem um, is situated within the larger scope of sort of the many threads that we have in this anthology. I know that's a big question and I don't mean to, you know, there's no, there's no, <laughs> there's no perfect answer here. So I don't mean to put anyone, anyone on the spot. Um, but if anyone would like to open it up, Fran, I mean, can I just go to you for a second? Okay, I found my unmute button. Oh, um, my poem was written um, after George Floyd's death um, and we all watched the horrible films on television. And um, I, I was just, it was an attempt to grapple with a public death and what's so horrifying, of course, is that given the recent events in Georgia, we have not yet left that realm. We're still there. We're still looking at death in public. And it, it's just, it's terribly depressing. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing I was really so impressed by, by the submissions of what many of you read this evening was that immediacy of responding to what was happen, happening um, during the months of the call and when we were getting submissions. I know many of you said that the poems were sort of older, but it's pretty amazing how these poems are still so palpable. And I feel like they could have been written in May, but yet maybe they were written three years ago. And the, you know, it's just still so immediate is absolutely um, amazing and also very sad, right? To think about the state of our, our, uh, of our union here. 
Um, so Fran, actually one of my direct questions was, th I was wondering when you had written that poem um, and who do you feel was the audience for that? I mean, I could ask this to any of you, but Fran, if you don't mind responding briefly, who do you feel is the audience for your poem in many ways? Well, I think I was envisioning this certainly as a poem for people who were um, not Trump supporters, to put it <laughs> politely, um, and and people who were not thinking about the fact that we have we're accustomed to going to the circus, for example, as a way to be entertained, and it just nothing feels like entertainment. It doesn't feel like entertainment anymore, and that was what struck me. Right, is that it's too much about death and we can find death just turning on the television. Absolutely. And Nubia, you had mentioned, I wrote that down in the part that we didn't publish in the book. You had also mentioned the circus. You mentioned um, Barnum and Bailey. No, it wasn't Barnum and Bailey. Sorry, I'm looking back at my notes, which are, which are a bit scattered. But you had mentioned this idea of spectacle. And so what are the ways in which you feel maybe the American narrative is so much about spectacle and the ways in which we respond to what we see as opposed to what we witness. Would that be a fair question, Nubian? I'm not sure. You asking me or are you asking? Um, Nubia, actually, Nubia. Okay. Um, unmute for a sec. Oh, unmute Nubia. We can't hear you, Nubia. It's all good. Yeah, I need to hear the question again, I guess you said that well, um, I was responding to Nikki Haley's attitude. And before I even heard her say the words, this is nothing but political theater. This was her response to, oh, I don't know how many different countries. It was probably about 30 that got up and spoke. And they talked about America pretty bad too. I was kind of surprised. But she got up and she, and, I'm, and, I, and just her attitude, I was thinking, wow, this is nothing but a minstrel show to her. And, and right after I was thinking that, what came out of her mouth was, this is nothing but political theater. You hear that thrown around a lot now, like, okay, this is just the show. Because, and she said this, because you can't do anything about it. We have the power. This is our policy and you can't change it, right? Because the UN doesn't really have power to enforce, at least not the, the big five, right? So, you know, she tossed it up like that. So I was just uh, kind of responding you know, maybe maybe exaggerating a little bit of, of what she, her attitude and what she was saying. So yes, yeah, spectacle, but, but what you're saying about spectacle, I mean, we can just think of many things that become spectacles. I mean, we look at the, uh, this trial that's coming up around <clears throat> the George Floyd killing, murder. It's becoming somewhat of a spectacle. And I don't know what the procedure is. I don't know if they're going to televise it or not. I think I've, I've heard that it will be televised on court TV, but I look for it to be another kind of spectacle, uh, like the spectacle of the OJ Simpson trial, which I know a lot of people have feelings about that. However you felt about whether you was guilty or not, but just the way it was played up. Long before the trial even started, you know, they were teaching classes and linking OJ to Othello all right, in, 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 in Shakespeare's play. So it's, it's just, you know, it's, the spectacle is very much a part. Become, it's very racialized, very racialized. Absolutely. Uh, in this country. Shana, I'm sorry. Well, Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Kathleen, please. I, I just wanted to tag on to that because it struck me that um, part of what I responded to so intensely about what I was seeing replayed and replayed on CNN during the Baltimore uprising was that one same shot of the overturned police car and the you know projection of an image and the imposing of a narrative through images on a community in which there are many narratives, many stories that were never going to be told in the crux of that moment. And I think what's been so um, stunning about being in a multi-vocal choir tonight with all of you is that idea, that invitation for the many narratives 
to be a part of the one narrative. And that is not going to happen through any you know, political degree or media action or God knows social media, but through our own creative work to claim and invite and you know, name the narratives around us and not just our own. Yes, um, well said, thank you, um, both Nubia and Kathleen. I think, uh, you know, the creative state of our union is, is so important, the ways in which we can respond uh, to what is happening and bear witness to so many things that are happening around us that maybe, you know, the news is really not uh, or what we see being played over and over that takes on a takes on a different voice. You know, it takes on something that we're not able to actually witness, which is so important. So, um, if I may, just to, just to get some other um, voices in. So, Danuta, I know you talked a lot about um, traveling and crossing borders. So, Danuta, maybe you could speak a little bit, and then I'm going to go to some others. What are some ways in which you feel that traveling or the immigrant voice? How is that spoken? to what America looks like. So how, what are the ways in which uh, you've responded maybe to some other poets that, uh, that you've heard tonight? Uh, Danuta. Oh, unmute for us, Danuta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I succeeded. Um, you, you, you want to talk about traveling or the not possible to travel? Right, so what I guess sort of, you know, that being out as like a closed off borders or maybe you could speak just a little bit about how the, um, your, how do you feel your immigration experience would be different from someone who's been here from a few generations? Or of course there's different types of immigration, right? But what are the ways in which you feel that this immigration, um, your voice has been sort of, what's upon a, a larger thread within the book? I don't know, it's very difficult to compare all this. Um, I guess, you know, I haven't read all, all of the <laughs> entries, it's impossible, it's a huge, wonderful book. Um, I, I never really, you know, when I came to the country, I never expected to stay here. <clears throat> so that's one thing. I assume that many people come here on purpose, right? I mean, that's for sure. <laughs> Is my case that that's really the intervention of history that I was cut off from my motherland. So for many years, I couldn't go back home. So when martial law was in, declared, we, I couldn't talk to anybody. The, the letters were censored. So how typical is this situation? I, I guess there are Almost everybody has a, such a different story. In a way, I'm surprised that there are so many possibilities for so many different stories. Sure. And that's why I pay big attention. And I, you know, when I choose the um, languages and poems for the La Craven Review, I want to also give different angles, different experiences, different cultures, because there are never two same stories, same experiences. Yeah. Does it answer what you yeah, <laughs> were asking? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Danuta. And I kind of, I could uh, maybe throw it to Kadani, if you don't mind. Kadani, I, how do you, I guess when 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 you speak or, or when people see you, the, the, you know, how much of sort of that cultural sort of um, immigrant experience do you feel that you bring your own? Um, I think my, you know, Haitian culture and uh, my upbringing in Haiti, you know, how unusual it was. I, like I said, I lived in two worlds. We, spent, we went to school in Haiti for nine months and we were here for, for three months of the summer. Um, that, I mean, that's something that's, you know, in, in, ingrained in my identity. It's not something that I can never really separate myself from, you know, that's how I see the world, that's how I think. Um, that's, uh, and it, it's infused in, in all my writing as well. Um, so it's definitely you know, part of my, my identity. Right, and also I know many of you included um, excerpts from other languages, Nubia, mm -hmm. Kadani, uh, Danuta. How do you, do you feel like there's some, um, I guess the question would be, what are the ways in which you feel like language is such a part of your experience? 
immigrant experience was different? Like? For me, it's been a blessing, you know? Uh, and I, I, I know some people kind of um, hesitate to, to put other languages in poems. Um, I never feel weird about doing that. I just, you know, I assume it's, it's, it's understood in context. And it, even if it's not, it adds a, a texture that, you know, people can still feel, even if they don't know what they're reading. Um, so for me, that's, that's, that's just a, an advantage that, that I've, I've definitely used um, as I write. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kadani. Uh, maybe I'll shout out this poem to um, Jessica and, and Chris, if that's okay. So landscape, right? So maybe Jessica, could you speak a little bit to how landscape and walking down streets and, uh, you know, I assume maybe this is a real journey that you took to, to the Library of Congress. I know I've taken it myself a few times. Uh, what are the ways in which just sort of, you know, walking around uh, the area that maybe the origin story of, of the inspiration of landscape for sort of our our collective narrative. Yeah, I think um, place has always been really central in my poems. And um, I think it's, um, you know, th this poem, the poem that was in the anthology called Back, I wrote when um, I was in a very kind of unrooted time in my life. And I, uh, you know, I had actually just just rented this room after having been living on my friend's couch for, you know, for um, eight months or something. And so it was like, I was finally getting my, um, my own space again. And I was, I was new to DC. Um, I mean, I grew up in Maryland, but I had been away and I'd just come back. And, and, um, and I, so I didn't have a lot of sense of belonging at that point. Um, and I was, um, I, I think, um, I th you know, uh, the manuscript that this poem is from is called Near Stranger, uh, Near Stranger. And, um, and I think there's a lot of that in, in across um, the work I've done in the last several years is this sort of sense of um, belonging and kinship that I get from just from being and, and this is interesting during the pandemic because you know we're not getting much of this feeling from from strangers you know we're, we're kind of cloistered um but you know i would get a lot of that sort of sense that, you know just from brush encounters that are just being among other people and um and you know i just i i, I guess i feel like um place is you know it's kind of like a call and response sort of thing like you know you, Kind of a back and forth like you you know you you projecting onto the place the place kind of forming you and um and yeah th that sense of belonging i think um you know that i mean it's it's a it, it's something i i miss the, <laughs> the, that kind of walk or that kind of um that kind of motion in a place and among other people. Yes, absolutely. I <laughs> I miss it too. And there's so much of that of that sort of uh, the landscape here, you know, and just visiting places and localities. Um, Chris, just you know, it, how do you feel like landscape speaks to you, or what's the inspiration? Why Why did you want this poem in this book? Um, because I'm I'm shallow and I'd like to be published. <laughs> um, but to, to speak to what Jessica was saying, so I, I think we, we need to ground ourselves in the in the specificity of a poem in order to get to the universal, right? So you, you need that texture in a poem, that geography. Um, Maxine Cumin would call it the furniture. You need the furniture inside of the poem. Uh, and I think once we once we are in that feeling, those colors, that the specificity of it, uh, and and sort of rooted in our in our own experience, we can then speak to other people and and hopefully um, gain a kind of uh, community with them without knowing it. You know, a, a kind of communication. Right. Yeah. The abs yeah fellowship. Absolutely. You know, all the furniture. You know kind of in our in our collective room right absolutely mm -hmm. thank you all
Thank you. Great answer, Chris. Thank you all so much. I know this would wrap it up. We're right on time. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you to uh, Tacoma Park Art Center. Thank you to Brendan Smith, who organized this. Thank you to Kathleen, to Nubia, Jessica, Fran, Chris, Danuta, Kadani. So wonderful to see all of you. And thank you so much for your work. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jen. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Yes, Take thank care, you. Take care, guys. Nice to meet you all. You as well. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank Bye. you. Good night.